And good evening, we're live. Um, hello everyone, my name is Rira, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual event with DJ Waldi and Caribbean Fragosa. Uh, before we begin, I have some quick guidelines. Uh, this event includes an audience Q&A, and to ask a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any questions you find interesting, and they will make their way to the very top of the list. Also, if you're considering on supporting our bookstore by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book, Becoming Los Angeles, just click on the green purchase button directly below, and you'll be directed to our website where you can complete your purchase. And our next virtual event is scheduled for Thursday, August 20th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Oh, sorry, not August 20th. Oh. <laughs> um, but, but regardless, please check our website for more updates on our virtual events. We do have uh, quite a couple coming our way. Um, and with that said, let me introduce our speakers real quickly. Uh, DJ Waldi is a cultural historian, memoirist, and translator. In books, essays, and online commentary, he has sought to frame the suburban experience as a search for a sense of place. He has published five nonfiction books, including Holy Land, a suburban memoir, Real City, Downtown Los Angeles, Inside Out, and Where We Are Now, Notes from Los Angeles. And joining him today is our interviewer, Caribbean Fragosa, who is a journalist, fiction writer, and artist from South El Monte. She is the co-editor co of Boom Magazine and the founder and co-director of the South El Monte Art Posse, a, multidis a multidisciplinary arts collective. And with that said, I'm going to uh, turn the screen over to our guests. Enjoy. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Hi, DJ. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm good. I'm super excited um, that I could join you today. And I'm happy that we're joined by so many people and more people are still joining us. So that's pretty exciting. I know People are very busy with their Zooms and their Crowdcasts 24 seven these days. So it's such a privilege that so many of you guys are willing to share more time with us here on this platform. Um, and thank you to, to Jim at Angel City Press for inviting me as well uh, and Romans for hosting us. Um, so uh, we don't have a ton of time and I'm really eager to just jump into chatting with you about the book. Please. Okay with you. Yes, of course. Um, so, um, and if those of you out there, uh, if you have the book, uh, please feel free to flip through it and come up with some questions. I'm sure many of you do. And if you don't, um, order the book and um, you'll get to see what all the excitement's about. Um, so, um, this book, um, Becoming Los Angeles, Myth, Memory, and a Sense of Place, uh, is very exciting to me because I was uh, immediately, um, I fell in love with Holy Land when I first read it. And I've been such a fan and follower of your work since. And I always tell people this and um, not in any kind of exaggerating way. I really mean it when I said Holy Land changed my life. And I know that your books do change people's lives because they change the way that we look at the places that we live in. And um, there's this uh, this speech that um, uh, David Foster Wallace made uh, years before he passed away uh, to a graduating class uh, at a university. And he, he made this, uh, he told them the parable of the fish in the water uh, and he, he the story goes that there's a fish in the water and they're having a conversation. And uh, the, one fish asks the other, like, how's the water? And, he, and the other guy, the other fish says, what's water? And that to me speaks to how we're often, especially in LA, not often, uh, but elsewhere also, not totally aware or don't totally understand the place that we live in. We don't even think about the air we breathe until something's on fire and we're choking on it. And uh, I think what your books do, and this new book is, does for me as well, is it really brings that awareness back into place, back into the air, back into the landscape, and back into the history. Um, and when we start to do that, it really makes us think differently about ourselves. 
Um, so um, I, I just wanted to put that on the table as something to think about and you can address. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to ask you, um, there's been a lot of writing in over decades and decades about what is LA? People are always trying to define what is Los Angeles. Uh, and I wonder, and I wanted to ask you this very general question, what compelled you to undertake this project? What is it that brought you back to the question of what is LA? Well, you know, um, Caribbean, I've been writing about Los Angeles for a very long time, um, since 1995, really. And the pieces in this book actually go back to 2008, when I began writing uh, a weekly uh, column for the KCET television website. And I have been spending all these many years thinking about how we look at Los Angeles and trying to figure out a, an approach to uh, understanding how we become more intimate with this place, more, well, to, uh, a phrase that uh, the uh, environmental writer Barry Lopez uses, how do we become more vulnerable to this place, which is a very, very powerful thought. And I begin thinking about that issue of vulnerability and the issue about how becoming more native to this place, more intimate with this place. I think about this in terms of developing a sense of place. So I've been thinking for a long time about how I develop my sense of place here in, in Lakewood. Uh, and I think perhaps part of what this book is trying to do is to put before readers an array of various people, including myself, who have struggled, sought, sometimes failed, maybe, maybe more often than not, failed to develop a sense of place, failed to become part of Los Angeles. So the becoming concept here is evolving a sense of place and what materials, what experiences, what habits are required to do that. And I put before readers my own habits and I put before readers the, the histories of and, and habits of other people who are associated with the city of Los Angeles. A, if you want, it's a handbook about how to find a sense of place and to construct it in one's life. Mm -hmm. Right, and I that that sense of vulnerability or the almost requirement that one become vulnerable to to the place and become sensitive to the place that we inhabit and that we move through is is a really compelling idea, especially because I feel like in LA and the greater LA region. And um, especially if we're in our cars all the time, there's a lot of um, guarding and sort of armoring ourselves with um, not just cars, but like style and fashion and all these other things that we sort of come to define ourselves with. And so when we strip that away and, and we become vulnerable to a place, it almost seems uh, antithetical to what a lot of Angelinos believe that they need to do, uh, especially if they feel like they need to survive in this city that sometimes can be so cruel, especially Indeed. for low income and working class people. Oh, exactly. I, and there's an awful lot there we should, should unpack. Um, my own practice in becoming uh, vulnerable to my place and developing a, a broader sense of place not just a sense of place for Lakewood, my home, but a sense of place that's capacious enough, an imagination large enough to uh, include the broad, uh, boundless thing that we call Los Angeles, um, begins for me by not being in a car because I'm not able to drive, never have. And I walk my place and discover myself in it through what I only can call a kind of tactile Im intimacy. I smell it, I, s I hear it, I taste it sometimes. I, uh, it touches me and I touch it back. And this kind of uh, a haptic is the, t is, the, is the term of art, this kind of haptic practice has made me acutely attuned to my place. So if you're going to become a more sensitive to your place, more vulnerable to your place, wherever it might be. It could be Los Angeles or Seattle. If you're going to become 
more intimate with your place and develop a sense of place, you need to come in contact with it. You need to literally walk its miles, put shoe leather down on concrete sidewalks. That's one way of doing it. But the other way is, of course, becoming uh, fully aware of the history of the place where you are. Part of the problem with, with uh, stripping away all the surface stuff in Los Angeles, just as you described, is that often there's nothing behind that. And there ought to be history behind that, there ought to be experience of the past behind that. So a part of this book is about, about history and about how people in the 19th century struggled, succeeded, failed, maybe made gross mistakes that li linger today in con constructing a sense of place in Los Angeles. And I think there's also a part here in, in uh, the book which reflects on how people came here and what they gained and lost in coming here. So all of these dimensions of, of uncovering a sense of place are parceled out in different ways in the many short essays that constitute this book. Right. Um, and I really, I have to say, I love um, that walking and uh, walking in Lakewood is sort of the entry uh, into understanding place and understanding Los Angeles. Um, because I feel like it really does give us, um, I don't know, the skills in a lot of ways to, to be able to, to understand any place that we go to. I feel like once we have acquired those skills, we can apply them to other places that we visit or live in. I mean, I come, I'm from El Monte in the San Gabriel, in the San Gabriel Valley. And uh, that's, and, and I was a, a bus rider and a pedestrian for most of my young life. And so that was my way of understanding place. And my dad uh, is a truck driver and that's a different way of understanding place as well. And so I, I, I feel like I acquired a lot of skills by living my life for so many years in that way. And the other thing you mentioned about history as a way of becoming attuned seems so important. And I, I think I have a question about that. Um, yes. How does, you have a, actually, you have a question in the afterword where you ask about, um, you, you ask, can awareness of the city's past be of any worth to us except as nostalgia or irony? And before I darble off my thoughts on that, I was wondering if, if we could come to that question now and have you try to answer it. Certainly. Well, of course, I'm going to answer that question by saying, of course, the past can be more useful to us than, than either nostalgia or irony, which are, which are the two kind of polar opposites when we talk about the past in Los Angeles. I think the past has to be understood in a very nuanced way. It has to be understood in a in a, in a critical way, a problematic way. We need to use our, our approach to the past as a critical tool for unpacking the myths that have clouded what uh, this place is. And the, uh, the, uh, our failure to, to connect with the, um, the indigenous populations of, of the Los Angeles region. Um, we, we often make the mistake, we meaning uh, many of us, who, who live here, not everyone, certainly. But many Angelinos make the mistake of thinking that Los Angeles began in 1950, when in fact, of course, it goes back thousands of years. Right. And many people have the illusion that Los Angeles is the furthest corner of the westward expansion from the east coast of the United States. Well, in fact, of course, it's the northern capital of the tropics. It's the, it's the farthest uh, east, uh, of the farthest west when we speak of Asian, Chinese, Japanese, Korean uh, migration to Southern California. Los Angeles was always a global city, a, a, a crossroads, north and south, east and west. And if we don't understand that, that hybridity, that mixture, that, that, that uh, uh, a gathering of, of lives and, and people and personalities and cultures here in, in this global city, we, we make a mistake about where we are. And we make that mistake sometimes, we can make a mistake about who we are as well. Right. 
So I, what I'm hearing right now is that history helps, um, well, it reorients us. Like once we stop thinking of LA and California as the, the furthest corner of the Western, whatever it is, it, it just kind of messes with our sense of direction and where we fit into that map. What does the map even look like? And a lot of ways it turns it upside down or sideways. And, and I think, uh, I, I think we could all benefit from reorienting ourselves, especially nowadays when we seem to be going clearly in the wrong direction in so many yes. <laughs> aspects. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the necessity of history uh, is so important, but also as a way of belonging. Um, when we think about um, the placelessness that people um, experience in LA, even people who have lived here for many years can still find themselves displaced for a whole bunch of different reasons. What, uh, I guess what one of the things you're pointing to, or you are directly pointing to, is, is using history as a way to reorient ourselves and 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 um, sensitive um, find that sensitivity again to the place that we're inhabiting. Yes. And, um, um, I'm thinking a lot about displacement because in your, I think it's in the introduction, you talk about. Uh, how many of us are feeling displaced now, especially during yeah. pande pandemic times? And I and I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more about that. Yes, um, we are suffering, all of us, even those of us who may have a uh, an active sense of place. We're all suffering a, a displacement, and and that is partly driven by by uh, the pandemic, uh, partly driven by uh, transformational changes in our demographic and so social milieu. And we're also uh, uh, suffering from uh, displacement through the current economic crisis. Uh, in many ways, demographically, uh, sociologically, environmentally, uh, that we, we are in a different city in fact, so different that in in writing some new material for this book uh, in the last few months, actually, uh, I raised the question, how do we talk about Los Angeles? How do we imagine Los Angeles? If it's not exactly Los Angeles anymore, if it's so, if there's so much displacement going on that, that we are separate from the city of dreams and, and, uh, and ambitions and aspirations that were true six months ago. And I don't have an answer to that question. I wish I did. But if we don't uh, become uh, more attuned to what this city is becoming, we're unlikely to be the Angelinos that Los Angeles needs. Um, that are, we need to replace ourselves in the city. And I think partly what this book tries to do, although it wasn't written for the purpose of dealing with the pandemic driven uh, moment, this book tries to tell people, tell readers, here are some ways that you can become placed in your place. Here's where, here are some ways in which others have done this task going back more than a hundred years. Maybe some of these techniques, tools, stratagems, feints, uh, uh, expressions, maybe some of these will help you find your place here. Because I really do believe strongly, and, and, and I've said this many, many times, that a sense of place is as necessary to a whole human being as a sense of self. Without a sense of place or a sense of self, you are not whole. Yeah, I, I believe that as well. Um, and I, I'm hearing urgency in the things that you're saying, um, and also in the in the introduction and the afterword of the book. Um, did you feel maybe not the urgency of pandemic while you were putting this book together, writing this book, um, or was there something else that you felt was really driving you in this project? <laughs> Yes, um, I wanted to create um, 
in my own way, somewhat odd way, I think, I wanted to create a kind of handbook on, on how a sense of place is made. And that was the purpose of all my writing from 2000, from 1995 onward, but specifically since 2008 until, until today. But the, the sen sensation that I felt that uh, displacement was, way, was flowing as a wave across um, the Los Angeles landscape, uh, that, that sense of where do I belong here? How, do, how is my place still my place? That really uh, framed the, the preface, introduction, and the afterword in this book, sort of giving uh, a, a stronger emphasis to some of the aspects of, of the writing that, that are there when I began writing it in 2008, but are now made more the focal point of, of, of what I've written. So taking text from the past, but giving it a new emphasis, a different tone, a different even musicality uh, mm -hmm. because of the current situation we find ourselves in. Mm. Um, you just a few minutes ago asked the question that keeps poking at this part of my brain. And you asked, are we the Angelinos that LA needs? And right. I think that's a really strong question that I think a lot of us need to ask ourselves. And maybe we're not accustomed to asking, are we the, the kind of person that this city needs? The answer could be no. I mean, yes, that really incites us to uh, re-examine our habits and our behaviors. Um, so when we think of this book as a handbook, uh, what I'm also seeing is a, a series of questions that you're really posing for the reader, important questions that can help guide us in how we move forward into this future. Um, are we the Angelinos that LA needs? Uh, I don't know. And this uh, brings to mind another thought that I've had for a long time is um, how can we how can we be at the service of the place that we live? And um, I'm thinking about this thing that my friend and artist Arturo Romo said, uh, in conversation a couple of years ago. And he said that people often think about a place belonging to them, especially um, during processes of gentrification in terms of owning a place based on the buildings that we own and the properties that we own or don't own. But we don't often think about how do we belong to a place? So the other way, like the flip side of that. And I think there's some of that in what you're saying now. Very strongly, um, I have uh, very strong feelings about that, and and the, the book really is much about that that question uh, of belonging uh, on both sides of that equation. On my belonging here, and it and it has a demand it makes its demands on me. I belong to it. Uh, so your uh, it, that's a very apropos understanding of of what this book is about and, and what it's trying to do it made more intense it's, it was always about that but made more intense by the by the current situation of that sense of displacement which really begins to question uh, uh, criticize uh what was a fairly settled understanding in my own mind about what a sense of place is and how it works so this is this this book is uh, of the moment uh, even though it has material that goes back 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking about some of the characters that are in the book, um, like uh, the button maker, the button woman. Yes, the button lady. The button yes. lady. The button and, lady. Uh, she and then uh, Hugh Hauser, like just right. down the street, um, and how these characters are part of the city and how do they i don't know just how do they how are they necessary how are they part and they are because they all contribute to this making of a place but i i was wondering if you could speak to these characters that you include in the in the book such as the button lady and her wiser <laughs> Yes, and uh, and uh, Tom Hatton, who was a, a children's TV host when I was a child, and, and
It seems like uh, DJ had connection problems, and I think we're back online. Was I not connected? For a second, I think. Ah, we're, but we're here now, are we not? Good. Yeah. Um, Button Lady, uh, Hugh Hauser, uh, Tom Hatton, all of these good people uh, are, are in the book because they made use of the materials around them to make some kind of connection with the, with the community, their community. Uh, the Button Lady uh, is there because she takes something very mundane and, and ordinary and commonplace, and she makes it makes it an experience. She gives uh, a, an ordinary commercial transaction a kind of uh, remarkable aura. Uh, Huell Hauser's in there, obviously, because Huell Hauser was a spokesperson for uh, engaging with place, being fully there for uh, all sorts of ordinary people in their ordinary lives, which he found extraordinary. Uh, Huell Hauser is the is uh, the master of take, taking something plain and ordinary and making it seem, and I think actually succeeding in this, making it seem really quite special. And and uh, people like um, like uh, uh, Kevin Starr or some of the other uh, figures that I uh, write about are people who who made use of other tools to turn everyday life, the materials of the ordinary, the things around them, turn the, those things into powerful tools for uh, investigating, criticizing, and and becoming uh, connected to the place where they live. There, these are all examples. And I, frankly, I, I make myself an example and, and offer my experience as a way of turning the ordinary and the everyday experience of Los Angeles into something that is, I, I think for me, a, a profound uh, a emotional uh, connection. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking about. The, the strong um, emotional connection <clears throat> A strong emotional charge that happens with the most mundane things. Uh, I mean, one of the things that it, one of the stories that I always tell, which is a completely boring and I don't know ridiculous story that I have about South El Monte, is that one time that I fell off my bike, and I can always point to that one corner, and it's just a story that nobody really cares about, but I find it to be like a really specific emotional attachment to a place that makes me belong to that place and that place belong to me. And um, and I feel like these mundane stories that you're describing right now are, are just so valuable and necessary um, that we learn to tell. Sometimes I think people don't understand the value of their, of their little stories. Um, and they're, sometimes that's all we have. Sometimes that's the most important thing. Exactly. We don't. We need to realize that with um, with a, a proper vision, uh, our everyday life is filled with places of memory, and that uh, they those places of memory persist. We also tend to think that Los Angeles has erased most memories. Well, actually, no. Everywhere in Los Angeles, there are places of memory, uh, and which can be as the site of your bicycle accident can be can. Those places of memory can persist every time you encounter them, reminding you of the emotional uh, complex that it was that was attached to it. And if there are places of memory shared by many people in your community, a park, a school, a bar, uh, it could be almost anything. But if it's if it's commonly shared by many people, then you have a powerful mechanism for community building. And that's why uh, preservation of places of memory is very important uh, to, to the future of Los Angeles. Uh, if we aren't attuned and sensitive to uh, our communal places of memory and actively help to create them, if, then, if they're not there, if we don't do that, then we begin to lose our, our material, haptic, touch, feeling, emotive, affective, find the right word, uh, connection to the place where we live. And if we lose that that emotional connection, we become we become poor citizens. We become bad at being making public 
making choices for what the future of the city should be. So when I say, are we the Angelinos that Los Angeles needs, what I'm really saying is, have we invested enough of ourselves in this place that we are capable of making the right kinds of communal decisions for its future? Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I find this to be, yes, a scary time in a lot of ways, but also very mm -hmm. exciting. I think we see a lot of really exciting changes. And I know it might scare some people to see a group of young activists uh, destroying a monument, um, pushing over the statue of uh, Junipero Serra or Christopher Columbus. But uh, what I see is uh, a movement uh, in which people are, are ready to start telling their stories and they're ready to, uh, to not be passive um, and to become engaged. Um, and if you have any thoughts about um, what we're currently experiencing, not just in LA, but throughout the country with the uh, rethinking of monuments, I mean, I'd love to hear that. Well, um, as I said, I uh, am, am thoughtful about places of memory. I'm also thoughtful about, about uh, memories that have been in, enforced through mythology or, or um, uh, through authoritarian means. I'm concerned about memories that uh, are are compelled rather than that rise organically from from lived experience. That are uh, memories that are not um, the, the shared property of a community. I'm I am conflicted myself about uh, t taking down some monuments. I think there are places of memory that might be recognized monumentally. But I'm also fully aware that um, there is a, a reckoning here, uh, particularly in, in our experience in Southern California with a past that has been so mythologized that it's true history, it's, it's the, the history that is most meaningful has been, has been pushed into the background or, or virtually lost. We are, we are really reinventing what we mean when we, we talk about the past in Los Angeles. And that's not going to, that's going to be a painful process when we take when we when we unpack false memories myth mythologies and replace them with the experience of uh, the communities that have always been here yeah yeah thank you for saying that um i have a lot of questions and thoughts about uh, mythologies um in the landscape um but for this in the service of time, we don't have too much more time, but I, I really want to talk about the suburbs. I mean, you're from Lakewood. I'm from the San Gabriel Valley in El Monte. Uh, I want to talk about the myth of suburbia and what it used to mean and what does it mean now? How have you seen the suburbs change and are, are there new mythologies emerging about the suburbs or do they still remain? Um, I've lived my whole life in Lakewood, so that's a fairly long time. I've seen a great deal of change here as as many people have in Southern California. Uh, I know that my community began in, in early 1950 uh, as a place where uh, young men and young women, many of them recent, uh, recently in, in the Second World War or the Korean War, uh, found a, a, a place to live and it made a decent life. There was a lot lost in in what they gained, uh, and there was a, there were many many thousands of people of color who were not permitted to share that same experience. Um, there is that long history there that that needs to be uh, uh, clearly articulated. However, I do generally believe that the mythology of suburbs, um, the dystopic mythology, the mythology that all suburbs are somehow places of aching loneliness and, and that basically all of them are sort of an ante room to hell uh, is a real mistake. Uh, I think uh, genuinely redemptive lives were led and are being led in the suburbs of America and certainly in the, in the suburb that I live in. Uh, it, and my neighbors, who are us all, who are as mixed and mingled and hybrid as as LA County is, uh, are still uh, aspirant, uh, not quite middle class, almost middle class, working class people, who uh, are investing themselves in their place and in, in doing a 
a, a remarkably good job at, at that task. Um, there are plenty of plenty of uh, uh, unhappy suburban places to live in Southern California. A lot of McMansion uh, uh, neighborhoods and gated and guarded uh, uh, subdivisions. But in my working class, not quite middle class suburb, uh, fit lives are being lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot about how how we can rethink what the suburbs are. And to me, it feels really necessary. Again, growing up in El Monte and South El Monte, a kind of suburb, it's uh, not the suburb that Lakewood once was. I don't know if it ever was, maybe in part, but now there's such density in parts of Southeast LA and the San Gabriel Valley. It's like a suburb, but it's also not. I don't know what it is. Uh, it's Los Angeles. It's Los Angeles. Um, so that's something I think about a lot. And one more suburbia related question is, um, ha having grown up in Lakewood and living there still now, does it affect the way you look at Los Angeles and think about Los Angeles? Oh, yes, uh, in a couple of di different ways. One thing, um, Lakewood and Los Angeles aren't places in in direct opposition. An awful lot of Los Angeles, the big thing called Los Angeles, the smaller thing called Los Angeles County, and the city of Los Angeles, all three of these things, an awful lot of it looks alike. Uh, Lakewood is not uh, unique. Uh, there are hundreds of square miles of suburban development throughout the entire region, and it all, all looks much the same. So that my experience in Lakewood uh, is not are going to be as radically different from someone's experience in San Fernando Valley or in El Monte or in Pacoima or in Temple City or in Cerritos or, and I could go on and on and on. There, there's lots of commonalities there. So that when I talk about my, my own life here, I'm not talking about an island uh, remote from other places in, in the region. We're, we do share an awful lot of the same built environment. Mm -hmm. And part of this book uh, is uh, an attempt to make that make that case. Uh, there is a tendency in Los Angeles for people to live in, in some place about which they have some positive feelings, get in a car, drive some miles to some other place where they have a job, and their world is like a dumbbell. There's a mm. pod here, a, a stretch of freeway in between, another pod there. And stretch in between is nowhere. It's placeless. It has doesn't have any real existence to that commuter. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that in between the the home and work, part A and part B, there's a tissue of neighborhoods and lives and places of memory that deserves your my understanding and maybe even my affection and maybe even my loyalty for that matter. That's that's part of what I'm trying to do here is to break down some of the atomization that is the characteristic of our thinking about Los Angeles. It's not, I don't have all the answers. Or I don't have even many of the answers, but I, but I do have a, some answers to how we connect the, the disparate parts of the region into something more whole, mm -hmm. into something we can call Los Angeles. Yeah. And call yeah. home. Right, and I think um, it also requires that we all sort of exercise our imaginations in a much more expansive way because uh, LA is composed of so many neighborhoods and some of us are so regional and just like viciously loyal to our one little neighborhood and that's it. Uh, so it, it, it seems like a necessary exercise again in expanding our imaginations and, and thinking in a larger co collective we beyond our immediate environment. We, we Angelinos need an imagination capacious enough to live in all the places that we can call Los Angeles. We need an imagination big enough, capacious enough to include the city of Los Angeles with its hundreds of square miles and millions of residents, the county of Los Angeles with its more square 
hundreds of square miles and more millions of residents. And then that big thing, that place of fear and dreams that we call Los Angeles. We need to imagination big enough for all of that if we are to become the Angelinos Los Angeles needs. Thank you. I um, think it's now a time for questions. We do have a couple on here. Um, so I'm going to read out the most popular question. Uh, you did uh, touch upon it earlier, but maybe you can expand more on it. Do you put any stock in the old adage that Los Angeles is merely 10 suburbs in search of a city? Is Los Angeles truly a geographical place or is it more of an idea? It is very much a geographical place defined by the topography of the Los Angeles Basin and uh, shaped by thousands of years of human habitation. But it's also a place of the imagination and mind and memory. Uh, it is both of those things. And uh, though it is often said, although it's a little difficult to prove that it was said, it's often been said that Dorothy Parker said that Los Angeles is seven suburbs or 70 suburbs or 10 suburbs in search of a city. Uh, and it's, and that I, sadly <laughs> reflects what happens when you fly in, or in her case, take the train in from New York City, uh, spend uh, a week or a month in Los Angeles and go back saying, uh, I went west and I hated it. So. All right. Um, next question. Um, can you talk more about walking and how to do that in a place that is so oriented to automobiles? Uh, well, uh, despite the fact that many, many uh, miles of sidewalk in the city of Los Angeles are desperately in need of repair, mm. it's still pretty easy to walk around Los Angeles. And I, I, know I one thing, one positive outcome of the pandemic is an awful lot of people are out walking their neighborhoods. In, during these days of uh, social distancing and, and uh, distance from jobs and places of, of amusement. There are going to be a lot more knowledgeable residents about the topography of their neighborhood and the people who live there than, than before, along with a lot more healthier dogs because they're, they're all walking their dogs twice a day. And so when I speak of, of the value of walking, I, I, I'm not trying to be a, a, a offer up a, um, you know, a, a moral crusade. I'm only saying get out of the front, uh, get out of your house, uh, leave your front yard, uh, uh, put one foot in front of the other and look around you and be attentive to what's, what's happening. Uh, unplug the stuff from your ear, take the screen away from your eyes, uh, listen, uh, smell, uh, feel, uh, become in contact with the nature that, that's present everywhere in, in Los Angeles. Uh, don't distance yourself from the from the, uh, the, the 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 intensity of the natural world that's out there uh, that you'll you'll never find if you're in a car or plugged into electronic media. One foot in front of the other is walking, and that's all you need to do. All right. And uh, next question is from Elaine. What advice do you have to people researching Los Angeles? Some of my Cal State Fullerton students uh, in a research seminar called Stories of Los Angeles are here. So I'm wondering what advice you have for them and others trying to understand our region. Oh, that's, fa that's fascinating. Well, you have the resources that are available through the consortium of, of libraries called LA as Subject. Uh, and that's a website with uh, some powerful tools. Um, you have the resources of the LA, LA, LA County Library System and the City of Los Angeles Library System, which um, I've always used and have, have been uh, I found a great deal of value uh, in using them. Uh, but um, I would suggest that there are um, uh, mul multiple websites that uh, explore the 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 everydayness of, of, of Los Angeles history. Well, there's a fascinating website about Boyle Heights. Uh, there are several, several uh, websites that, that deal with uh, the Eastern, Eastern communities of, of the LA area. Uh, I, I, I have found them very valuable as well. 
Um, I'd call your attention to the programming produced by KCET, uh, their Lost LA program uh, directed now by Nathan Masters, who was my editor for some time at uh, KCET's website. Nathan Masters, Ma Nathan Masters Lost LA series, uh, which is available online, uh, is quite, quite uh, useful uh, and, and beautifully produced too. Thank you for uh, the advice. Uh, our next question is from Adam. How would you contrast and compare your approach to defining a sense of place and a sense of myth for Los Angeles uh, from some of the other writers who have approached it, such as Mike Davis, Linnell George, and Norman Klein, and many others? Um, I think I learned and have learned a great deal from reading Mike Davis. I've learned a great deal from reading Norman Klein, and I am I am learning a great deal by reading um, Linnell George, and also some of the other writers who uh, have been important to me, like Wanda Coleman. I think I'm my approach is n not particularly different. I'm not a theorist of uh, society. Uh, I don't have a, a an ideological um, tool to bring to my discussion of a sense of place as uh, Mike Davis. Uh, uh, I am not without criticism, uh, but I'm also not without hope. Uh, I'm not without complaints about what has been made of Los Angeles, but I'm not despairing of it either. Uh, I understand Norman Klein's uh, concept of erasure, that means a great deal to me. I understand how the past and, and our much of our connection to Los Angeles has been erased over time by both uh, literally erasing the hills and, and filling the valleys of, of Los Angeles, as well as erasure of memory and, and the communities that hold memories. Um, my, my approach to the, the question that you've just asked is uh, framed by, uh, not to be make a bad pun, but I'll have to make it anyway. My approach is much more pedestrian than theirs, than, than Mike Davis or Norman Klein's. All right, and our next question is from Susan. Do you talk at all the role that earthquakes have played in defining our city's sense of self? Not in this book, but that's a very interesting question. And there's some, some new books or some recent books about that. Uh, subject have been uh, been published. I think there's a brand new book called uh, The Great Quake Debate about uh, uh, how talking about earthquakes or, or mistaking what, what causes earthquakes was part of how um, one set of myths about Los Angeles was created in the in the 20s and 30s. Uh, but but to, to answer your question more more pointedly, uh, the the threat of natural disaster of some of the big one of some of some terrible catastrophe fire earthquake uh social unrest leading to uh, a breakdown of uh, community life these things hang over los angeles in ways that perhaps aren't the same in other parts of of the of, of united states and that does color how we think of ourselves here. We live on the edge of something. And that uh, ominous uh, back of the mind concern uh, does pl play into how we understand who we are in Los Angeles. Right, our next question is from Sherry. On what occasions was your sense of place for Los Angeles missed challenged? Oh, when it was most challenged? Yes. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, I, I'm sort of casting about. I, I suspect uh, uh, it, has, it has been challenged frequently by um, uh, writers who bring to Los Angeles a different sensibility than mine, who ha have um, raised questions about its validity or, or its authenticity as a place. And that, is, that led me to, to 
find ways in which I can validate my understanding that it is an authentic place. It's not, not an inauthentic place. But I would have to also say, having lived through uh, many periods, several periods of civil unrest in, in Los Angeles, those periods have um, been the source of much distress. And, but also perhaps periods of greater awareness. Why did these events occur? What forces were there producing them? So I have had to question uh, the mythology of Los Angeles and also question my own uh, middle-class Anglo uh, place in it. Uh, and and I've, I've had to return to uh, many sources that I've used in the past to, to find um, my balance within, within those moments when I was uncertain that I belonged here and have discovered that I do belong here. All right, I think we have time for two more questions. All right, All right. so our next question is from Mary. Why do you think outsiders, um, parachute journalists, so often get LA so very wrong? Well, uh, there's an easy answer for that and maybe a complex or a hard answer answer that. The easy answer is that Los Angeles doesn't look like other places. The, the, the territory, the terrain, the, the physical form of the city doesn't look like other places. It's, it doesn't fit the, the uh, uh, imaginative and, and intellectual framework that many writers about place um, uh, have. Uh, and that means that that sense of disorientation we talked about earlier, that Caribbean and, and I were talking about earlier, that sense of displacement lingers uh, during, during their relatively brief stay here. And having not become familiar or even develop a sense of awareness of how the parts of the, the city uh, connect to each other, they go away with a fragmentary view of a fragmentary city. Uh, so uh, the, the oddness, the, un, un, the unlikeliness of Los Angeles is one reason why parachute journalists get it wrong. But frankly, the other, another reason is, and that would require maybe more of everyone's time, is that, that, that there is a profound uh, misjudgment of who we are in Los Angeles, uh, that, that we are somehow... Uh, not legitimate members of the American enterprise, uh, that Los Angeles is somehow marooned off the edge of the continent. Uh, and we don't have anything to say to the American experience, either because we're so exceptional as a paradise, but more recently we're so exceptional as a, as a hell. And that, uh, that uh, notion that Los Angeles doesn't have anything to say to the, to the rest of the American experience does, does make it difficult for those parachute journalists to say very much about us that's very meaningful. All right, we're at our last question, and this question is from Mark. What fiction writers best depict the nuances of Southern California? Whoa, that's a tough one. Uh, there have been so many. Uh, Michael Connolly, Walter Mosley, uh, uh, Aris Janigian, who's a uh, uh, an, an interesting uh, novelist about the um, Armenian experience. Um, uh, John Fonte, uh, who probably someone who is often referred to as as uh, getting the the uh, Los Angeles of the 30s and early 40s. Uh, Charles Bukowski, uh, who uh, whose take on on the city is. Um, scabrous and hilarious and uh but worth reading uh those are just a it's just a very few that come to mind uh uh we could we could uh add well uh caribbean you could add some of the writers who wrote for east of east right who, uh, uh, i'm thinking michael jaime becerra he comes to mind exactly and uh, I'm also thinking of Seshu Foster. Seshu Foster, right, right. And uh, uh, there are several others who uh, are 
whose whose young voices or younger voices than mine certainly, whose younger voices uh, are uh, be, are wonderful interpreters, and that interests me too. Who will be the new interpreters of Los Angeles uh, as we we pass through this period of displacement? I'm very eager to hear all those new interpreters uh, uh, and what they have to say. What stories will they tell about their Los Angeles, about themselves as Angelinos? Great, that was our last question. Uh, thank you, DJ, thank you, Caribbean, for uh, the lovely talk. And thank you to all of you who tuned in. I was checking the chat and a lot of people were sharing resources, so that's lovely. Um, again, if you would like to purchase the book, just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. It will take you to our website where you can order it. And also, if you would like to uh, continue supporting our bookstore, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter and to also check out more virtual events on our calendar. And the replay of this event will be available on the same URL link in about an hour. And we will also be re-uploading the talk onto our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So uh, stay tuned for that. And with that said, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much. And have a good night, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. And thanks again.